Tommy Henter, your boy Sky, joined here today with Manuel Pastor. Okay, tell him what you do, who you are, and what it is that you do. Well, I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Southern California, and I direct a few research centers that do work on social justice issues. Uh -huh. I'm an economist by training. Right. Uh, and so I've been quite focused in on issues of economic inequality and racial inequality and how that plays out in our contemporary society. Okay. So right now we are in the midst of this coronavirus, I guess it's a pandemic now. Yes. Um, will this plunge us into a recession? It's quite likely to plunge us into a recession for a number of different reasons. One of the things that's unusual about what's going on is that it's both a sort of supply side shock and a demand side shock at the same time. On the supply side, the fact that China got hard hit and wound up shutting down its manufacturing, that actually disrupts a lot of the sort of supply chains that go uh. to products that many of us buy. So for example, this iPhone here, mm -hmm. uh, it might have been designed in California, but all of its parts were put together in China. Uh -huh. So when workers aren't going to work in China, a lot of the supply chains of goods get disrupted, and that has a big impact on the economy. But the other thing that's going on is the demand side. I mean, one thing we forget, you know, coming here today, uh, the metro is much emptier than usual. Oh, what? The streets are much emptier than usual. That's true. That's true. And restaurants have less people going to them. It's likely to be even less in the future. That means that those workers that work in those restaurants are going to wind up getting less hours. They're going to wind up getting less pay. That's going to be less demand in the economy. The more that people stay home mm -hmm. and don't engage in retail or buying in restaurants, et cetera, the less money in the economy. And that's a demand side shock. So uh, economists right now are predicting that definitely the U.S. will go into a recession uh, this quarter uh -huh. uh, before it's done. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news. They do say that economists are bearers of bad news always. <laughs> it's been called the dismal science with good reason. <laughs> That's what they call it, the dismal yes. science. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I've, I've even heard um, reports that it's very likely that shelves, just because everything comes from China, could be empty by maybe April right? because they aren't able to restock or resupply. I think that's going to be the case with a lot of goods. But, I mean, the bigger things to think about are the way in which Chinese manufacturing goods sort of fit in to manufacturing in this country. So parts of engines and cars and all that sort of thing. The other thing that's been really important is that the Chinese have shut down their demand for airplanes. And one of our biggest products out of the United States is air airplane assembly from Boeing. So that's going to be a big shock in our economy, too. And I think one of the things that's really difficult about this situation as well uh -huh. is that the federal government's kind of out of tools. You know, normally, if the U.S. goes into a recession, the Federal Reserve will try to lower interest rates, but interest rates are at historic lows. Or the federal government will try to spend money, but thanks to the Trump tax cuts, which benefited the wealthy, the government has this huge deficit and pretty limited ability to spend even more money. So uh, we're about to go into a recession without the usual tools that we've had to combat recessions in the past. Um, that's it's, that's it's, the dis it's dismal. Would, do you think it'll be worse than 2008? Well, uh, the thing that's different from 2008 is that the 2008 crisis was a crisis of oh, sort of financial yeah. gridlock. Uh -huh. I mean, it was housing. What happened was that the housing market collapsed. Once again, uh, people felt like they had less wealth because they had less wealth. So they spent less. That impacted the economy. Construction shrank. Housing shrank. We had a real – we had a, uh, a recession in what's called the real economy where mm -hmm. people actually work, et cetera. But the big thing in 2008 was financial gridlock. That is that there were so many risky instruments out there because of the subprime loans and the way in Wall Street, which Wall Street had sort of created crazy financial instruments, that basically there was financial gridlock. The banks weren't lending to one another. Finance kind of got paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And that was really the big worry, was when banks don't lend to one another, when people can't trust credit, it's very hard for people to do business. The financial system is in better shape now, uh -huh. this may be a little bit more like the recession that was triggered by the 9-11 attacks uh, in 2001. That is uh, something where there's a collapse, in that case, of uh, the travel industry that had ripple effects around the economy and led to a recession. So this, this, shouldn't, have, this shouldn't be as hard-hitting as 
as um, 2008 was? Because I, th I think the 9-11 one was not as intense as 2008, or am I incorrect? In no, you're correct. It was not as intense, and there was an ability to sort of recover from it. Uh, what economists are saying about this one is that its recovery might not be as quick. And the reason is that these supply chains are very disrupted, mm -hmm. and the you, it's going to be sort of difficult to just re-articulate them. I think one thing that's going to start happening is that businesses will say, maybe it's a little risky to have all of our inputs offshore someplace else, and they'll start thinking about bringing them closer to the United States. The other thing that's fascinating uh, and scary and kind of horrible about this current crisis is that it's revealing a lot of fundamental problems that were already there. So, for example, um, I'm a professor mm -hmm. at the University of Southern California. We're about to, starting tomorrow, take our classes online. Right, yeah. Yeah, they're saying that it's a, uh, you know, kind of a, a fire drill test to see whether or not we need to do this on a more long-term basis. But a lot of other universities have done that. But I can still teach. My students can still come uh -huh. uh, virtually. I imagine the experience won't be as rich, but they're going to continue to pay me. Uh, Facebook uh, and Amazon have both uh, asked their employees, if they can, to stay home and work remotely. That's going to work fine for their high-end software programmers. Right. But what about the janitors that clean those buildings? Yeah. What happens when those buildings are less used and they cut back on janitorial services? Or when, for example, in the part of downtown Seattle where all of those Amazon employees go out to lunch, it looks like a ghost town right now. And it means that the workers who work in those coffee shops and in those restaurants aren't going to work. They're not going to be paid. So the inequality that's already baked into our economy is going to be uh, reflected through this crisis because the people who will be the hardest hit won't be the knowledge workers who can work remotely. It's going to be the sort of face-to-face -face service retail people who are either going to run... Labor. Right, they're either going to run the risk of going to work and getting infected, or there's not going to be enough work and they'll be staying home and not being paid. It's a little bit like the way in which uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, revealed the underlying inequality in New Orleans. Yeah. This is going to reveal a lot of the inequality that's been existing in our economy for some time. Okay, so do you, if, if, um, if, any company, even universities, start working online, and it's successful. You're able to get your message out almost the same way as you do in a classroom. I know it's different, but I'm just saying, if it's successful, even remotely successful, it's unlikely that they would ever allow people back, right? Because wouldn't it be cheaper to have your employees work from home? So we could be in this situation forever, where the majority of businesses have a lot of their clerical stuff done done remotely. Well, there's a lot of benefits for people working face-to-face. -face. It's one of the reasons why I braved the virus to come and talk to you today. <laughs> um, so we can, we can see that there's been a game here by having us in the same room that we wouldn't have had uh -huh. doing this remotely. And, you know, I know, for example, in my own research center, we've given people the option if they either themselves have health concerns uh -huh. or, more importantly, have a family member who may have health concerns and they're worried that they might pick up the virus and then infect that family member who might be more vulnerable than a, a young person, right? But, um, you know, the, the, the trick is that there's a lot to be gained working face-to-face. -face. There's a lot that happens when uh -huh. spontaneous interactions occur, when you just drop in on someone's office, when you try to solve a problem together, and a lot to be gained in a classroom when you're able to actually be with people. So I don't think there's really a substitute for that kind of contact. Uh -huh. There is, however, a deep concern in the academy about the fact that universities have been trying to go online for some time because it really would lower their costs. So this could be the catalyst right here. Um, yeah, you know, this could be a fire drill not to deal with the uh, coronavirus, but rather a fire drill to deal with trying to make us teach uh, 18 classes with thousands of people online, uh, a much perhaps lower quality product. So we'll see what emerges. You're right. I think there are businesses who will be tempted to do this. But there's a reason why uh, Facebook and Amazon are all clustered together in kind of one place uh -huh. because there's a lot to be benefited. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
It's called tactile knowledge. You gain a lot from just being around people and being able to turn to the person next to you or say, let's have a spontaneous meeting and solve this kind of a problem. But if I'm a businessman, I'm looking at this and being like, okay, tactile, it's, that's fine. However, I'm saving so much money by not having an office work, you know, an office that I have to pay rent on and not having, you know, all the vending machines in there. Now, this does put the janitorial staff out of service, all the maintenance men, but all that cost for me is gone. So I have to think that you probably can see a lot of businesses stick with this. Well, I think you'll see some begin to experiment even more and some have done it. But again, I think there's something to be gained from having mm -hmm. people in the same place. You know, there's a reason why uh, uh, roughly 40% of the nation's venture capital goes just to the Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. Yeah. Because it, you know having people clustered there, actually interacting with one another, really has its benefits. But I will say, I know that you have been an Andrew Yang fan in the past. This is certainly making an argument for oh. making sure that people get a 1000 bucks of government support each year. <laughs> because if their jobs are going to be uh -huh. more remote, uh -huh. or if their jobs are going to be less secure because of what's going on, the kind of security that Yang has been talking about, and the kind of security that people promoting uh -huh. a universal basic income strategy, it's going to be more critical in this moment. Imagine if you're a, a line worker uh, who works at a coffee shop, or who works in a restaurant, or who works delivering packages every day, uh -huh. and you're worried about the virus, but you know that if you don't go to work, you're not going to be paid. Think about how your calculus would change if you had a $1,000 cushion that had been provided for just this sort of emergency. That's really the kind of uh, beauty of the conversation that had taken place around the universal basic income. It's a conversation that once Yang got out of the race, it's been kind of receding. Uh, but it's still critically important there, there to couple, what we need to do. There are a couple, um, there are a couple people who run in now kind of on a universal basic income platform. I mean, obviously, at a much smaller level, yes. you know, like in uh, this co county, this county, that, and then there. Like the experiment in yeah. Stockton that Mayor Stubbs is doing. Yeah. So, so you're, you're a supporter of universal basic income. I think it's a really intriguing idea, and I the one thing I would add to it is that I think it should be reframed as a data dividend. That is, rather than thinking about it just as a government handout. You know, uh, the big data companies the, who use the Internet – They've benefited from our public investment in basic research so that they could develop their tools. I mean, the Internet really comes from government investment in what yeah. was called the Dar Dar DARPANET. Uh, secondly, most of the way that they uh, make money is from data that they gather from, from you us. and yeah, me. Right? Yeah. So what's interesting is that if you're in Alaska, there's something called a permanent oil fund, uh -huh. and you get a dividend each year just by virtue of living in Alaska, Alaska because they view the oil as being sort of a common resource and people deserve some return to it. Basic research and the data that these uh, companies use to make money, that's a common resource that we contribute to. Mm -hmm. People living in the United States could, should get their uh, if they don't get their data back, which it looks like uh, these companies are not going to let them do, uh -huh. uh, they should at least get something from the fact that we're sharing this data. Do you think that we would see some kind of universal basic income in the near future? Or do you think it's, that's like 20 years away? You know, the thing I think that's very interesting is that the sort of window of what's politically feasible has been opened up in a number of different ways. First, there was the Yang campaign running on universal basic income, interjecting that issue into uh, the public sphere in a way that it hadn't been before. Um, second, Bernie Sanders has clearly pulled the dynamic political di dynamic to the left, um, even if he's unlikely to win the nomination. I don't think you would have seen this kind of conversation about Medicare for all mm -hmm. or erasing college debt or a number of other things. Third, this current crisis, the coronavirus crisis, I think is going to really open up a couple of interesting possibilities. It's going to point out the need. I mean, we've got half of the U.S. households who have less than $400 uh, in the banking account yeah. in case there's an emergency. It's very difficult for them to stay home from work, even if they're ordered to do so by the government. Um, you know, that's going to really reveal what we've done in terms of allowing such level of wealth inequality to persist. And I think there's going to be much more discussion of wealth taxes, of the inequality that's been baked into our labor market. So I think these things 
you know, they're very difficult moments, but they also reveal some underlying social chasms. And I think that there'll be some pressure to try to take advantage of this moment to address those kinds of things. Of course, not by President Trump, who's managed to combine incompetence <laughs> and cruelty into one single administration. Uh, but I do think that if there's a political change, uh -huh. particularly at the presidency, you've got really competent people who can come in and address some of these concerns. Okay, as an, as an economist, okay, you <laughs> a lot of debate is, you, you have Republicans saying that, hey, this is the Trump economy, you know, all the gains. And then you have Democrats going, wait a minute now, Obama started this, this is the Obama economy. Are they both responsible for the success we have in the, I mean, break it down, who did what? Kind of depends on what you call success. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Trump tax cuts uh, were a little bit like sort of giving a little more crack cocaine to an addict so they can keep on going. Mm. That is, this economy uh, recovered after this very deep recession, the Great Recession of sort of 2007, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was on a sort of a steady climb. And if you look at the number of jobs created so far during the Trump administration, it basically mirrors the number of jobs created during the equivalent last months of the Obama. last last couple of years of the yep. Obama administration. So it's been basically on a steady roll. It probably would have petered out a little bit, except for the fact that these Trump tax cuts put so much more money into the economy by juicing up the deficit that there's been more spending. But it allowed us to uh, continue to have a whole lot of inequality. So I didn't, and uh, you know, the big uh, selling point of Trump is, you know, how's your 401k? Mm -hmm. That is that the stock market soared under Trump. Well, a lot of that occurred because if you give a lot of rich people money, mm -hmm. they've got to park it someplace since they can't, you know, they can only eat so many meals out or buy so many yachts, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of money to be able to park into the stock market along with the fact that the Federal Reserve had interest rates very low. And what that means is that what's called treasury bonds, mm -hmm. your ability to buy into the government debt, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get a high yield on it. So the safe place to park assets was into the stock market. Mm -hmm. This current uh, uh, crisis has shaved so much of the Trump recovery in stocks off the stock market. I feel like he's going to be limping into the re-election with an economy that's in recession, with a stock market that's fragile, and with an underlying set of problems of income inequality that have not been addressed. So as an economist, uh, we tend not to give any president too much credit. They're often always presiding over what just happened. Uh, but the Trump administration, one thing I think that's been that it, that it can quote unquote take credit for is getting rid of all the tools that we're able to use right now <laughs> to address the recession, because <laughs> by creating a gigantic deficit and by pressuring the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates so low, mm -hmm. we're entering into a recession with no tools. So I guess they can take credit for that, but it's uh, sort of like you know stripping away uh -huh. the supplies that an army might need and saying, "Isn't it great what I did?" Okay, so <laughs> with the national debt, because one of the things that is not taught in, in, in most schools is economics and, uh, you know, financial planning and all this sort of stuff. Okay, who do we owe our debt to? Who are we paying back? Let's start there. Well, we're paying back ourselves because a lot of the treasury bonds are actually owned by Americans. U.S. folks, right? Okay. Uh, Americans. But there's a big uh, Chinese uh, purchase of the bonds as well. And that does mean that, for example, this is another kind of, I hate to like create a lot of anxiety in your life. Uh, no, no, no. I like it. I, okay. I like it. <laughs> there's, good to know what's going on. I know there's a reason why you have so much alcohol in the <laughs> other room, just <laughs> for the, the news that your guests might bring, right? But, you know, the Chinese economy is not used to this kind of slowdown. It's an e been an economy that's been growing uh -huh. at nine to ten percent a year for you know decades, and then this year was slated to grow at around six percent, and people were declaring that a real slow growth kind of you know really worrisome thing. With the coronavirus sort of locking up parts of the Chinese economy, it's probably going to, if it grows at all, grow much less. Um, so, are the Chinese going to have the resources that they need to continue to purchase? Um, uh, American uh, treasury bonds, right? And I think the other reason that they've been uh, doing that is that by 
purchasing American Treasury bonds, they're getting kind of rid of their excess capital that they've got. So I think they're going to have a little bit less excess capital to have a little bit less uh, demand for American Treasury bonds. And in order to make their economy uh, recharge, they're going to be interested in devaluing their currency, making their currency cheaper so that their products will be less expensive for others to buy so they can use export demand to prop up their economy. You know, the Chinese have been in their negotiations with the United States agreeing to buy a lot of imports from the United States and agreeing to keep their currency at a pretty high level so people don't want to buy their products. When they're facing their own economic crisis, are they going to be wanting to buy products from us mm. instead of from themselves? Are they going to want to keep their currency propped up? Or are they going to want to devalue it so that they can sell their products into the world? So uh, this is going to wind up being a problem from that side as well. But returning to the debt, we got a mountain of it. Mm. Uh, and we've been adding to it at an astronomical rate, particularly under the Trump yeah, administration. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, Republicans supposed to be fiscally conservative. And so some of the things he's done... You know, I mean, I, I'm 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 neutral, you know, as the host here. But some of the things he's done goes completely against Republican ideology. Like they were really focused on the debt, and all of a sudden, he's been racking it up faster than Obama has. You know, I think there's a really interesting pattern people don't pay enough attention to. Uh, the first Bush, George Herbert uh, Walker Bush, managed to tank the economy, and then a Democrat, uh, Bill Clinton, had to come in and successfully repair the tanked economy and bring the economy to the most solid growth in the late 1990s of almost any period during the post-war period. Uh, he was replaced by uh, W. Bush, mm. who managed to tank the economy again uh, <laughs> and create a financial crisis that had not been seen since the Great Depression. President Obama came in and took a long time repairing that and getting it back running with the longest uh, continuous period of job creation uh, since that that we have for sort of recorded economic, history, modern recorded yeah. economic history, 20th century, 21st century stuff. And then uh, uh, Donald Trump comes in and manages to give a sugar high to the economy and looks like it's about to tank as a result of the coronavirus. You might think that voters would notice a pattern after a while <laughs> uh, about who is breaking the economy and who is being brought in to fix the economy. Uh, but that that is what seems to be going on. It's also been the case that the uh, Republican attachment to making sure there are small deficits uh, is an attachment to that when there are Democrats in power. Uh -huh. uh, so when Democrats are running huge deficits, the Republicans complain. But when they get into uh, the presidential seat themselves or take control of Congress, they engage in these gigantic tax cuts. Mm. That's what President Reagan did and caused big deficits. That's what uh, W. Bush did and caused big deficits. And that's what uh, Donald Trump has done and caused big deficits. It's almost as though they don't really mean it when they're talking <laughs> about deficits. <laughs> so That could be one interpretation. <laughs> So, so going back to China for a second. So China owns all these treasury bonds, right? <clears throat> if they wanted to hurt America, could they just not put all of them on the market at the same time? Well, or that would be a problem for them as well. Well, one of the interesting things, and I think we've seen it in the Chinese response to the coronavirus. It's a long way to get at your question, but I'll get to it. Um, which is that the Chinese response to the coronavirus, you have to, if you've been following mm -hmm. the news, their number of cases were like 4,000 daily. Now they're down to 40. They seem to have really contained it, uh, which is pretty striking. And, you know, one of the reasons is that they both have an authoritarian government, right? Mm -hmm. They can just say, you all got to stop working, yeah. stay out of the streets, et cetera. But they also have a communitarian spirit. That is that they recognize that, you know, we're all in it together and that if I stop uh, going out and running a risk for myself, it's going to protect me, but perhaps more important, it's going to protect more vulnerable people around me. Mm -hmm. I think that communitarian spirit extends to their vision of the world economy. You'll note that President Trump was quite willing to kind of rip up trade treaties, uh, walk away from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, threaten European allies in ways that were actually really risky for the world economy. Uh, but the Chinese don't operate like that. They've actually been reluctant to be in a trade war with uh, the United States, and I think they're not going to uh, step away in a precipitous way from buying U.S. treasuries because they don't want to wreck 
the U.S. economy. They tend to think a little bit more about the system, and they tend to think a little bit more about the long term. These are two modes of thinking that one would not associate with the current president, who doesn't seem to think about the overall system, for example, NATO or the world mm -hmm. economy, or tends to think, you know, uh, beyond the next tweet or the next uh, political contest to what needs to be in place uh, over the long haul. Okay, let me let me ask you this China question because I noticed that um like last night on the news um now they're beginning to call it the Chinese coronavirus and the Wuhan flu, right? And a lot of people had issues with that. Wait a minute, that comes across as racist. And their response to that would be, well, you know, they call it Ebola, which is obviously an African word, and then West Nile virus and Middle East respiratory syndrome. Like, all these other viruses have names. Why shouldn't we link this to China? But in doing that, that's a telltale sign that a lot of guys in government now, because these were politicians and, and, um, and conservative um, media hosts using these terms, a lot of them now see that we need to move away from China, that we cannot have a lot of, because um, China, I think, right now makes about 80% of our medicine. We get a lot of steel from China, and we're not exactly allies. We're more adversaries than, like, if a war were to break out, a real big war, it would be most likely with a China or Russia. So they feel that China should not be manufacturing all our goods. Do you see it that way, too? Well... Uh, there's a couple of different things there. One is I do think that offshoring your pharmaceutical production is risky mm -hmm. because if a virus breaks out worldwide, uh, the producer of the pharmaceuticals, the vaccines, or the, the medicines is going to pri prioritize their own country rather right, than yours. Right? Right. So I do think in certain critical industries, we you know, often call them national security industries, et cetera, certain kinds of steel get stay stay in the United States because it might be critical for missiles or yeah. you know military airplanes and stuff like that. So there's a logical argument there, but like so much of what comes out of conservative media, uh, logic is not always dictating this. I do think that there's an attempt to kind of play into an anti-Chinese bias uh -huh. that's been part of the trade war too that President Trump sort of launched to, with China. And there's an attempt to, I mean, I, I think the other thing that's, uh, going on is the following. Uh, we know that the technical name for it is COVID-19 uh -huh. and that we generally just call it Corona the coronavirus. Um, but I think the kind of beauty of calling it the you know Chinese flu uh, is that it makes you forget that the reason you're sick is because your government didn't take preventive measures when they could have. Uh -huh. They didn't step up the production of tests. They didn't step up quarantining. They didn't take the kind of measures that they could have took when this was breaking out uh -huh. in Wuhan in order to prevent an outbreak in the United States. Remember at the beginning of this, the president was still talking about how few cases and how little risk there would be, et cetera. So I think that what's going on, uh -huh. you know, the initial sort of conservative media reaction <coughs> to COVID-19 was to say that it was a democratic hoax, it was a continuation of the impeachment mm. to take down the president, and that it was really being portrayed as a way to kind of point out that the president is incompetent. I think now the calling it uh, Chinese flu is sort of a move to do the same thing. It puts the blame back on China, which has done a remarkable job actually stopping the spread. Um, it, rather than putting the blame on the White House, which has done a remarkable job of not stopping the spread. What about this, though? In the beginning, the Chinese hid the fact, hid, hid what was going on. So yes. it slowed down the world's reaction time. Do you, do you think that Chinese, the Chinese should pay a price for doing that? Well, that Chinese are certainly responsible for that, much as we can sort of praise the last month and a half of their response, mm -hmm. which seems like it's been pretty transparent over the last month and a half, but then the first couple month or so, they were really trying to hide it away and avoid the political consequences domestically um, and internationally. I don't know how you make the Chinese pay a price for that, but it's certainly something that has call, caused a world uh, world problem. The reason I'm asking you this is because, um, I mean, Americans are going to die from this disease, you know, quite Americans a few. Americans have died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, they're dying now. But, I mean, but even probably even a lot more until we get this situation sorted out. And, you know, when you have that kind of loss, you want someone to pay a price, which would most likely be the Chinese. How do you see the U.S. government saying, you know, um, 
I mean, obviously not a war, but putting in some kind of punishment or some, some some measure to say, hey, you did this, you know, which caused all of this. Here's your punishment. I mean, what what kind of financial levers do we have to, to turn to make that happen? Or very few. You know, I th- uh, uh, we probably want them to continue buying our bonds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or our economy sinks, right? Uh-huh. We probably want them to continue to supply goods into our supply chain uh-huh. uh, or our real economy sinks. So... The, you know, Trump has uh, utilized some tariffs, for example, to uh, try to punish the Chinese for what uh, he thought and most people have thought have been unfair labor practices, unfair trade practices, and actually, perhaps more important, the way in which the Chinese don't enforce sort of intellectual so property, uh, rights, property yeah. rights. And, um, the, you know, you can buy a copy of any new movie in China quite easily. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but I, but I, so those are maybe the kind of tools that can be used. But I think the biggest thing will be trying to figure out how to get the pharmaceutical uh-huh. production back into the United States. Um, and there'll be enough blame to go around once this is done. So you, you, do you still see the Chinese economy surpassing ours pretty soon? Um, when I say pretty soon, I think they said by 2050 or 2040. I don't know the year. Well, I mean, I think the Chinese economy has shown uh, a lot of growth. Increasingly, it's showing a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you can continue to innovate in such a politically closed system is going to be something that we'll see kind of in the long haul. And I think that the Chinese, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I'm not a China expert at Mm -hmm. all, uh, but I guess this is a place where people speculate and even sometimes drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, But... uh, (laughs) But I, but I do, it'll be really interesting to see whether or not, you know, one thing that's happened in China in the last maybe decade or so is that a lot of the sort of environmental problems uh-huh. have been areas where Chinese citizens have been able to force their government to open up, be more accountable, mm-hmm. and be more transparent. Uh, because I think raising the issues of the environment haven't felt like you're challenging the co- Chinese Communist Party. You're just challenging local officials who maybe have done a bad job uh-huh. about releasing toxins into the air or you know poisons into the ground. And I think the coronavirus might be a little bit like that. It offers an opportunity to challenge the inefficiencies of the Chinese system and the lack of transparency in the Chinese system. So it'll be really interesting to see whether it creates any kind of political um, openings. Remember that this is also coming on the heels of all of those demonstrations in, in Hong, Hong Kong, Kong yeah. challenging the Chinese uh, mainland government as well and asking for more freedom and more openness. So it'll be really interesting to see how this trickles out politically. But for China to really succeed, it needs to be a more open and innovative society because that's really where the sort of growing edge of the economy is. It's not in simply replicating what people invent in other locations. Because that's, that's what they're pretty much doing, right? Yes, but they're getting much better. So, for example, their artificial intelligence work is really quite good uh, and a number of other things where they've invested heavily on being on the cutting edge of the technology. So I think uh, a lot of advanced industries in the United States are, are quite concerned about the uh, Chinese as competitors. And a lot of their sort of stamp it out manufacturing is beginning to move to other parts of Southeast Asia. How do, how do, we, how do we stay competitive against the Chinese? Because, I mean, they have so many people. You know what I mean? <laughs> like one four times the size of our population. Yeah, some some are pretty oh, close yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that we need to invest in ourselves and in our own knowledge economy and in our own capacity to innovate. Uh, and then we also need to recognize some realities, which is that if we move to an economy where innovation and knowledge pays, uh, that that actually comes, and we're seeing this in the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, with other kinds of workers along the way. So for example, every place where you have knowledge workers clustered, we're seeing very clearly with this pandemic, you also have an army of nannies and gardeners and food service workers. So you've got a lot of kind of low paid uh, retail 
and service workers who are meeting the needs of these knowledge workers. Mm. That means that as we think about designing an economy for the future, there's nothing inconsistent with investing in education, investing in knowledge, uh, pursuing innovation, and raising the heck out of the minimum wage and guaranteed and paid sick leave uh, and decent working conditions for all of these people in the other parts of that economy that support the knowledge workers. I think in the United States, we've thought that it's either sort of invest in the knowledge economy mm. and let it be free market and let these other folks sink, or uh, raise the minimum wage and forget about the innovation e economy. I think that what we need to do is to, to think about a new kind of economics which marries innovation and inclusion uh, and really sees that if we're going to make it in terms of being able to be competitive with the Chinese and actually just have a decent quality of life mm -hmm. for people living in the United States, mm -hmm. that we're going to need to think about a sort of economics of mutuality. What do we owe one another mm -hmm. as we move forward? That's what the universal basic income was pointing to. That's what uh, Medicare for all, whether you support it or think there's another kind of system, but the whole notion of universal health care is pointing to. That's what raising the minimum wage is pointing to. And if we think about how do we invest in knowledge and education and training and high tech, mm -hmm. and at the same time make sure that we not just drive the top but lift the bottom, that I think is the future economic narrative that we need to promote. Okay, but what about this? Because there's a small business owner listening to us right now, and he has three or four employees, and he's going, wait a minute, if you go to 15 bucks, I can't work with these five people because I can't afford that. Or you think that those would be very rare cases? Well, what the research had told us before this recent uh, increase in the minimum wage is that despite the fact that the economists have traditionally taught that it creates a lot of, or could create unemployment, there's very few, there's very little evidence of any disemployment impacts, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a positive employment impact because when people have more money in their pockets, they spend more, and that juices the economy. And also, when you pay people a little bit more, they work harder, show up, uh, do more work. And now we've been running a series of experiments because parts of the United States have been raising their minimum wage, and other parts of the United States have not. Uh, in those parts of the United States where the minimum wage has been going up, there's been an increase in employment. California, Washington, New York, et cetera. So there are challenges for small businesses. Mm -hmm. When you see the minimum wage go up, we need to be thinking quite creatively about how do we support small businesses through that transition? Uh, how do we make sure that there are you know, things like paid sick leave are things that the government assists with, particularly for smaller enterprises. And many of the minimum wage increases have created basically a sort of slower glide path for small businesses. Mm -hmm. So if the minimum wage is going up, it's going up uh, first in large businesses and sort of lagging behind a little bit for small businesses. So you're pointing to a real problem, but the fears of unemployment that most people have raised haven't been associated with an increase in the minimum wage, at least in the more modern research on the minimum wage and in the recent experiments on increasing the minimum wage. Just now you mentioned Medicare for All, which is, I guess, a single-payer system where the, yeah. government, the government would basically pay your medical bills. That, that, that's what single-payer is, right? Yeah. You see that happening in, in America anytime soon? Because that's, that's one of the reasons that Bernie Sanders is very likely to lose this primary is because he's in favor of Medicare for all. I don't think that's the only reason he's likely to use and we can, <laughs> <laughs> we can We can talk a little bit more uh, about that. But I think what the Medicare for all uh -huh. uh, uh, position has done is stake out a kind of place well to the left, I guess, in the political spectrum mm -hmm. around the provision of universal um, health care. Yeah. And I do think that what's generally supported in the United States is the idea that everyone should be able to receive health care, uh, probably uh -huh. uh, in, in the concept that health care is a basic human right. Um, but, I, you know, it's going to be very difficult to move to a single-payer system in the United States for a number of different reasons. One, uh, a lot of people, um, they might actually uh, 
kind of help hate their insurer, but they generally like their doctor, and they're right, worried about right. a change in the system that's going to do that. Uh, and then I also think that there's a lot of people who are working in the insurance industry, not just the insurance companies, but insurance employees, who'd be very worried about the disemployment that would result. And then, uh, you know, there is a, a challenge in the United States because uh, you really need to demonstrate that you've got a government that can handle something as big as health care. And when uh, you encounter problems going to the DMV, it doesn't sort of build your confidence that the, a government-run health care <laughs> system is going to move you through quickly, right? So I think... I think those are those are challenges. There are parts of the government that work quite well, and I think we should have more faith uh-huh. than we do. Uh, but so I, I I think there are things you can think about as sort of moving a debate in a particular direction. Mm-hmm. Medicare for all has moved us to say, well, yes, universal health care is what we need to get to. Uh, completely erasing college debt, uh, that's probably not going to happen. But thinking about how it is that low-income students can make sure that their debt is erased, Mm. particularly if they, for example, become a teacher or a firefighter or a police officer or a social service worker, I think that's the kind of thing that we will be able to move to uh, within the political realities of the United States. But when you, when but when you when when people talk about erasing college debt, because there's something I talked to Andrew Yang about as well. You know, half the country going, wait a minute, I didn't go to college, okay? I had to come out here and do this and struggle and this, and you getting X amount of dollars to pay for you. Wh- where's my cut? You you understand? Um, because that's how we are. We 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 are. Um, I guess this the scarcity issue. Where in like, hey, if he's getting something, why am I not getting something? You understand what I'm saying? I think so, but I this is why we it kind of gets me back to this sort of economics of mutuality of taking care of one another. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if our students uh, are able to graduate without extreme debt, they're able to buy a house sooner, mm-hmm. which juices up the economy for everyone. They're able to pursue a profession that speaks to their passion and their calling and not just their finances. Mm. Uh, They are able, therefore, to contribute in a way that actually maximizes their talent and probably in the long run will maximize their income. Uh, They are able to form families sooner because they're not scared about this debt overhang. And there's a big benefit for all of us from their ability to launch their careers more successfully. And I think this is a big thing. You know, this millennial generation is a generation that was born uh, uh, and very early in their life saw a big shock to the system with Mm 9-11 and the emergence of the security state and sort of deep concerns. They were hard hit by the financial crisis in 2007 through 2009, where many of them were jumping into job markets for the first time. And when you jump into a very weak job market, you wind up with a wage trajectory over time Mm -hmm. that doesn't, it's kind of more flat than if you jump into a good market. If you jump into a good market, get a good first job, you're able to get more mobility over time. If you jump into a bad market with a bad job, you get a flatter mobility over time. And then it's been very hard for them to buy houses because of the way that housing prices have run away. Mm -hmm. None of that was their fault, right? So the idea that alleviating their college debt so they can get a better start is somehow unfair to people, I think uh, we need to think about it a little bit uh, differently. You know, we uh, have been trained to think that if we're um, selfish, if we make sure that we just get what's due us, Mm -hmm. that somehow that's the right way to organize an economy. But you ask any business person who's successful, uh, why are they successful? Their answer almost inevitably is not that I, you know, really was a cheapskate and ripped everybody off <laughs> and uh, abused my workers, right? And that was really a recipe for success, right? Their answer almost always is, I treated my customers right, I treated my workers right, I treated my suppliers right, and because of that, I had the lasting relationships to build a business over the long haul that would be successful. Why don't we organize our economy that way? Yeah. No, it makes it makes sense. It makes sense. It, it, tot- it totally makes sense. Here's a question for you. I would add one thing. I do go ahead, go the ahead. other, the other thing. I, uh, you talked about people currently saying, well, they didn't go to college, so why does this other person get their college debt relieved? I think the other thing that's going on is someone saying, well, I paid my college debt, so why, you know, are you 
getting your college debt erased. But, you know, I went to, I'm 63 years old, I went to college between 1973 and 1978, and then another uh, grueling five years in graduate school between 79 and 84. Uh, man, it was cheap back then. Uh, <laughs> you could get out without uh, incurring a lot of college, uh, yeah. without a lot of debt, and it was pretty easy to erase that debt and get your life started. So hearing older people begrudge younger people when education has become so much more expensive, expensive. just just irritates me as an older person. And also, it's a little bit like, you know, I got paid $7 an hour. Now you're being paid $12 an hour. I think you should be paid 7 so you could suffer just like me. <laughs> uh, I just I just don't get that <laughs> attitude. It just yeah. seems to me that if we're able to lift the bar of decent human treatment in the economy, uh, that's a victory for all, all of, of us. us. Okay, I mean, that's that's a way to look at it. I, I didn't always look at it like that, but listening to you say it, I look at it like that now. I'm a changed man, okay? <laughs> Very good. I'm glad I had an impact. <laughs> so one of the things that you see right now is artificial intelligence becoming more common because we talked about, you know, the, the fast food workers. Um, <clears throat> you walk into McDonald's now, there's a kiosk, and eventually it's going to move to the back of the house, and there'll be AI make... Um, you know, um, automated burger makers. What happens to all these people when their jobs go away? Do you see that, 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 that you think there'll be some serious social unrest? Well, first, I'm trying to imagine McDonald's French fries being made by a machine. <laughs> uh, those are, of course, the only reason anyone goes to McDonald's. So, um, But uh, this is a real uh, concern, and I think that the interesting thing about what's going on with artificial intelligence is that the worry right now tends to be what's going to happen with someone working in a McDonald's uh -huh. uh, or someone working in retail when you can self-bag and yeah. all of those kinds of things. And I do think that those are, are real concerns, and there's ones, there are ones that need to be addressed through something like a universal basic income, income. or some kind of social safety net, uh, through things like... Uh, you know, community college is really mm -hmm. the vehicle that allows people who have less skills to be able to retrain, to be a nurse, to do some advanced manufacturing, to move into jobs that require the kinds of skills that cannot be easily automated. And I think one of the things that I would definitely support is I think f community college ought to be free for everyone who gets into it. These are, it's mostly people who are lower income, mm -hmm. and then it's also people who are transitioning from a job mm -hmm. in midlife to another job and need to dip back in for retraining. Mm -hmm. uh, community college systems are just so important for workforce development, and they're really the thing that's accessible to the kinds of folks you're talking about. So I think all of that's really important. But the thing that's really interesting with artificial intelligence is, is increasingly creeping up the knowledge scale. Yes. So a lot of software workers who believe that they are, you know, creating the artificial intelligence software that will replace these lowly uh, French fryers, uh, <laughs> but uh, they themselves will never be replaced. I've got news for you, right? Yes. They're going to find a lot of uh, programmers uh, being replaced as well by machines that can uh, program quickly or take over yeah. some of these tasks. Yeah. And I think once that you know, there's nothing like having your own job threatened to raise the overall issue of job security. Yeah, because they 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 say that there are going to be a lot of white collar workers who, look, for for instance, an accountant, an accountant, unless you're some kind of high end forensic accountant, <laughs> your job is in question. A lot of lawyers now, you have AI reading contracts. It's just so many things that artificial intelligence can do, and it's constantly getting better at whatever it does. So even if it can't do your job today. You look 10 years out, okay, that's a completely different story, you know, and so this this is coming. But I don't think a lot of politicians really take that seriously. No, I don't think that they do, and then they also, we tend to think about it just in terms of fear, and I think that's because of the lack of economic security that people feel. When you think about it, it also creates the opportunity for someone to move into those kinds of jobs that really are going to be difficult to uh, sort of substitute for with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Being a singer, yeah. being an artist, being a musician, therapy, uh, taking care of the elderly. You know, it's really interesting. When people hear, for example, about demographic change, 
what they tend to think about, particularly given the ethnic change that's gone on in the country, is the fact that the United States will be majority people of color in 2043 to 2045, somewhere in there. Uh, someone from the vantage point of California where we sit, which crossed that threshold in 1998, and where demographic change in the state has actually dramatically slowed down, uh. ethnically. Here's the big demographic change. Uh, in the year 2010, 11% of Californians were 65 years old or older. By the year 2060, 26% of Californians will be uh, 65 years or older. There's going to be an explosion of senior care. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to mean a need to have more care workers taking care of seniors. It's going to mean the need for more sick, uh, paid sick leave and family leave so that people can come from their work to take care of an elder if the person gets sick. Uh, it's going to mean thinking about the expansion of the care economy. Uh, and that's actually none of that stuff. I mean, you're not going to be sitting in a nursing home tended by a robot. There's going to be <laughs> someone taking care of you. So one of the issues is how do we take the enormous economic gains that we might get from artificial intelligence and move those gains into those parts of the economy, like the care economy, which cannot be replaced because they require human touch and human uh, thinking and agility and make sure that that kind of work is decently remunerated and also decently trained. Because right now we tend to think of that work as being low, page, low paid and low skilled. Um, but it's often low paid, but not necessarily low skill. Mm -hmm. Because taking care of an elder, making them feel like their life is uh, uh, full and meaningful, that requires a tremendous amount of talent. It's just not talent that's very well rewarded. And you know, uh, look at you, I could put a mirror and look at me, I can tell you one thing that is definitely true. 10 years from now, if we both live mm. through this crisis <laughs> with the coronavirus, <laughs> We'll be 10 years older <laughs> yeah. uh, and 10 years closer to needing care ourselves. And we need to be thinking about how do we structure a society that delivers that in a decent way. Let me, okay, that brings up a very important part of point about aging. One, you know, with all the <coughs> science now going into, into longevity, all the studies into longevity and, and curing various diseases, it's believed that at some point, we will be able to solve the aging puzzle, okay, where I guess everyone stays at your peak, okay? You had 20, you're 25 and in your prime. What, what would the economics of a world like that look like? Because you, if, you, if you don't have old people, right, that removes all the whole Medicare for all and because younger people tend to not to get sick. What, what, would, what would that world even look like? Because a lot of people talk about it, but I'm just curious from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the scary reality is it's probably less likely that we uh, live longer and stay young, but just that we live longer and stay old. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, which is and, even worse. <laughs> well, it, it means that there'll be all sorts of issues with regard to people's health. You may be kind of in okay shape mm -hmm. uh, and be able to live longer than you ever did before, but uh, how many knee replacements are you going to go through to be able to do that? Uh, how much respiratory care is going to be needed? Uh, so perhaps the vision you're talking about may come to play, uh, sort of being able to be Superman and Superwoman uh -huh. going forward into the future. But I imagine we'll be uh, a little bit more like uh, Joe Biden living another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Joe! <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> he seems to be okay right now, but you just never know. You know? Uh, <laughs> okay, here's here's a question: Would the United States having more people? Because one of the, we we have three hundred thirty million, or three fifty somewhere around there. China's I think at one point three billion somewhere around there. Would us having more people give us, I guess, a stronger force to go up against China, or not necessarily? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the best thing for the United States uh, is more immigrants. Uh, this is something, of course, that's not something that's thought about quite a bit uh, from uh, the current political moment uh -huh. in which the Trump administration has adopted a quite anti-immigrant attitude. Yeah. Uh, but if you think about the sort of changing 
age structure of the United States. Uh, what de demographers talk about a thing called an age pyramid, lots of young people, less middle-aged people, and as you get older, we pass on, mm -hmm. unless your dream of infinite life happens. <laughs> uh, and so it's kind of a pyramid. Uh -huh. At some point, there's very, you know, 90, there's very few in number of people who are around. Uh, but over time, the United States has become much more of an age cylinder. Less young people being born, our fertility rates have gone down. Uh -huh. uh, less middle-aged people, because there's less immigrants filling in the middle, and more people living for a longer time due to medical care. Uh, you know, the beauty about immigrants when they come into the United States uh, is that they come generally like their their youth is over, right? They come when they're older. Uh -huh. uh, they, they may be educated or not educated, but they jump right into the labor force and start working, and you didn't pay for any of their education right. or much of their training to kind of get them into the labor force and start contributing. Uh, for example, even undocumented workers contribute about 6 to $7 billion a year into Social Security mm. that they never take out because they don't have a mm -hmm. legal Social Security number, uh, helping to juice up the Social Security uh, uh, piggy uh, uh, chest, uh, uh, piggy bank, so that uh, Social Security can last longer going into the future. What most demographers and most economists agree on is the United States actually needs more immigrant workers coming into the middle at a variety of different skill levels to be able to fill the economy and to be able to grow in that kind of a way. Uh, if you look at a place like uh, Japan, where its fertility rates have gone down, yeah. people are aging and migrants aren't coming in, they've been in a very peri period of kind of slow growth and slow decline for quite some time. Places that welcome immigrants mm -hmm. tend to be more dynamic and grow more uh, over time. It's quite interesting because that's not, from an economist's perspective, uh, a thing that's left or right. Certainly in the, in the politics of the nation, we associate the right mm -hmm. with being more restrictionist, the left with being more welcoming, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but for the most part, from right to left, from the most free market conservative economists to the more liberal uh, lefty type economists, most think that immigrants are an addition to the economy in terms of economic growth. They tend to have pretty high rates of labor force attachment, pretty high rates of entrepreneurship. There are sometimes places where they compete with native born workers, and that's an issue that people need to address and take care of, but they're a boon to the economy. So if you were to kick them <laughs> out, if you were to kick all illegal immigrants out right now, the economy would most likely crash. Um, Yes, and I think that one of the things that I think is important to understand is that the number of undocumented immigrants in the United States actually peaked in 2007. Uh, it declined pretty sharply between 2007 and 2009 uh, because with the economy in the United States in recession, people went back to home countries. And then it's been on a kind of s slow decline ever since. So we're actually lower now in terms of undocumented immigrants in the country than we were certainly in 2007, but then even in 2009. And that's been a long-term trend. It hasn't been something that the Trump administration magically made occur um, with border enforcement. So one of the things that that means is that the undocumented immigrants we've got have been in the country for a longer Sorry. period of time. So while people think of undocumented immigrants as somebody who just arrived, they're working in the field picking strawberries, that sort of thing, here in Los Angeles County, where we're doing this interview, 70% uh, of undocumented immigrants in Los Angeles County have been in the country for a decade or longer. Oh, wow. And as a result, they've tended to form families. So, for example, again, in L.A. County, we've got about 10 million people. About 850,000 of them are undocumented immigrants. Living with them is about another 850,000 U.S.-born citizens, citizens yeah. who are their family members, yeah. and another 250,000 lawful permanent residents, people who have green cards, uh, who are legally in the country, who are their family members living with them. That means that 20% of Los Angeles County is either undocumented or living with a family member that's undocumented, <laughs> who may actually be a significant bread earner for that family. So you remove those undocumented immigrants, you're going to sink a large part of our economy and damage the economic security of lots of families. 
this has become something that's become a pretty important. It's become what economists call embedded labor. It's kind of embedded into our economy. But it's not just undocumented immigrants. Uh, legal immigrants, people who are here with green cards, they're critical to our health care industry. Uh, you know the share, a large share of nurses that, for example, come from the Philippines. Uh, yeah. They're a large part of our software programmers, a uh, large part of those who start uh, businesses, um, etc. They're in every part of the economy. Apparently, some of them even host podcasts. <laughs> That's right. I was born in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask you that question about 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 immigrant labor, though, is that um, and and China in relation to China, just looking at it from a number standpoint, at some point, would it make sense for the U.S. to begin, I guess, jo like adding countries in and annexing nations, for instance, it, I mean, willingly, not the old way where you used to jump in, plant your flag, and be like, hey, Mexico, welcome to America. <laughs> not like that. But but if you and a country have somewhat of, I guess, a mutual vision of the way it should be, democracy, forming a larger country, you, could you ever see something like that happen? Or are we too locked in and, hey, this is America, this is our border, we want no one else? Uh, we are way too locked in. Uh, at least we are. I mean, I and the forces have been uh, centrifugal, spinning things off rather than bringing things together. So, for example, you see what's happened in Europe with Brexit, mm -hmm. with uh, the uh, European Union, yeah, yeah. the United Kingdom actually separating from uh, the European Union, when in fact the European Union is tremendous in terms of creating the ability of people to uh, travel easily between countries, to be able to work easily in other countries, et cetera. Uh, but those kind of forces of, of nationalism and separation have been quite strong in recent years, particularly since the 2007 through 2009 Great Recession, when people felt their economic security threatened, and they tend to retreat to their corners. And I think that, you know, the Trump phenomenon in the United States, which has been anti-immigrant, uh, which has been which is delighted in the idea of a trade war with China, even though the people who are suffering the most from that trade war with China are, for example, agricultural producers yeah, like who, are, who, who, voted, who, are, for who yeah. voted for him, right? Uh, but they just like the idea of, you know, we are finally getting tough with these external folks. That That's sort of a, a big impulse. And I think one of the things that's been worrisome as well, um, although they've put it back together in a trade deal, is even the retreat from Mexico and Canada. That's not a merger of political systems, but a merger of economic systems. And it's, you know, particularly for the auto companies, it's really hard, you know, they have really benefited from the ability to make engines in Mexico and parts in Canada and then bring it all together for assembly uh, anywhere within that trifecta of nations. So I think the forces pulling us apart right now are unfortunately internationally a little bit stronger than the forces bringing us together but again, that economics of mutuality is the idea that we actually benefit by bonding and coming together. Uh, whether or not we do that as a date uh, versus marrying, mm -hmm. uh, which is what uh, you're talking about with countries merging, I think is up for grabs. What I certainly hope is that the United States doesn't go back to the old-fashioned planting its flag and saying, uh, we just uh, <laughs> uh, crossed your border and discovered your country. <laughs> <laughs> discovered Mexico. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we apparently think we discovered America, you know? <laughs> okay, so California, where, where we are right now, yeah. the taxes here are insane. I mean, I, do, you, do you feel that this state... By the way, how much, how much time are you We're have? fine. Okay. <laughs> but, by the way, do you feel that this state has just gone... Too far in taxation? I'll, I'll give you an example. So I read an article about, you know, um, marijuana, legal, mar legalized marijuana. And you would think that, wow, California is the place to be. But they charge the marijuana growers and producers here so much money that they've actually left many of them and gone to Oklahoma and set up shop. Because Oklahoma was far more inviting tax-wise. Like you only had to pay, I think, like this $2,500 fee. And you in business, we're in California, you have to do this, you have to do that. And it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then when you sell the product, they stamp a huge tax on it. So it's still cheaper to buy illegal weed than it is to buy the legal one. Wh where do you see California in taxes? Um, 
I keep thinking about Oklahoma reinventing its <laughs> uh, motto to be the land of pot. Uh, so uh, grow your own here. Uh, or actually, I guess it's grow yours for market here. Um, so I think there are certainly certain instances like the one that you're mentioning uh-huh. where uh, it's hard to think about the fact that uh, California, which – gosh, should be a pioneer in pot. That's just right. kind of our, you know, that's our personality uh, to imagine putting in these kind of taxes that are slowing things down. But, you know, I think, uh, and this will be not necessarily a popular opinion, uh, we need to remember that this is a high-tax state. Uh-huh. That is true. It's also a state that receives 50% of the country's venture capital that has job growth that's faster than what's going on in uh, uh, Texas uh-huh. that has uh, tremendous uh, uh, innovation in terms of its economy that continues to attract businesses. So the, the taxes haven't managed to really scare folks off, although people like to uh, complain about them as though they might. Apparently it's scaring off a few uh, pot producers. <laughs> uh, so I think that the, the issue, too, is that this is a high amenity state, meaning that we try to pride ourselves on having a university system that's the pride of the nation. We try to pride ourselves on having a K-12 through system that unfortunately is in the bottom 10 currently in terms of spending. But if we want a workforce that's going to be able to contribute into the future more effectively, we're going to need to raise that spending. Uh, we have a issue with re- being able to attract workers here uh, because of high housing prices. Yeah. That's going to require some government investment in affordable housing and mandates for private developers to do that. So we pride ourselves on the quality of life here because of the environment, and that environment comes because of government regulation and government taxes to pay for improving parks, uh, et cetera. So we're a high-tax, high-amenity state. Uh, we have never billed ourselves as a low-tax, low-amenity state. So those pot growers who've moved to Oklahoma, uh, I bet they're finding that that experience there is not as nice as being in San Francisco no, no, I mean, or the Bay Area yeah, I know they don't, or in I mean, Los Angeles. Yeah. My understanding <laughs> is they, they don't necessarily want to be there, but money-wise, it just makes sense. But we also have a lot of Californians leaving and going to places like Texas, like Florida. We do, and a lot of that has to do with the high housing prices. Yeah, yeah. And less than the... Uh, the research suggests that it's less the taxes than it's the high housing prices. And then in particular for millennials, the idea that you're never really going to be able to earn enough yeah. to catch that down payment to even get into this market. Yeah. And that's creating a lot of pressure for people to go to Texas where housing is particularly affordable. Yeah. Yeah, that's – that's uh, that really – I mean – because I mean, I, I listened to Ted Cruz the other day. <laughs> he was, was in quarantine right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, apparently uh, was around somebody with yeah, the coronavirus. Yeah, at, C- at CPAC. Yeah, the conservative political <laughs> where they were denouncing coronavirus as being a, a democratic hoax, uh, and apparently they were instead a petri dish for the disease. <laughs> okay, so so one of the things you know he was jokingly talking about how you know all these Californians are moving to Texas. But, uh, I mean, he, he, was, he was joking about it, but I know a lot of Republicans are seriously nervous about that because these guys are moving to be able to purchase homes, but they're not moving because they're conservative. So that would eventually change the, the, the color of Texas from, from red to at least purple. Well, there's a very interesting phenomenon in Texas, which is that the major cities mm-hmm. uh, have Democratic mayors and actually quite progressive local policies. And they tend to be surrounded first and way outside by rural areas that are deep red, Mm -hmm. very conservative, very church-going, very evangelical. And then suburbs, which are kind of moving over time from a more red direction to a more blue direction, those kind of Mm -hmm. uh, purple areas. And those are the kind of suburban voters that uh, might be kind of fiscally conservative, uh, but socially a little bit more moderate, mm-hmm. and they've been uh, quite alienated by Trump's behavior, and they were actually pretty alienated by Ted Cruz's behavior as well. You'll note that Ted Cruz, Cruz barely won in Texas uh, last time, against running Beto against Beto O'Rourke, yeah. and Beto O'Rourke is a quite 
liberal and was running on a very liberal platform. Very interestingly, Pedro O'Rourke had a geographic strategy of racking up votes in the central city, <laughs> but also demonstrating uh, that he went everywhere in the state. He was proud that he went to every county in the state, demonstrating that he was willing to appeal in the red areas, which probably made him more palatable to the purple areas. I'm not sure that it gained him any votes in rural Texas, mm -hmm. but it made it seem like this guy is trying to appeal to us. Um, and I think sort of uh, Republican, independent, leaning type voters in the suburbs uh, like that kind of gesture in their direction and begin to trust that even if this person doesn't have my views, they're going to kind of take me into account in a more serious way. I think if Democrats can crack that particular combination in Texas, mm. they're going to be able to really change things. The other thing that's going on in Texas is the growth of the Latino population. You know, when people think about Latino voters, they tend to think about people who are immigrants, mm. concerned about immigration. Um, each year, about 300 to 350,000 Latinos in the United States who are immigrants naturalize and gain the right to vote. 300, 350,000. Each year, about a million U.S. born Latinos who are 18 years old automatically become citizens. And they're pissed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because they see the way that their parents are being talked about. Yeah, uh, yeah. They often live in mixed status families or they have close friends who live in mixed status families who are themselves mixed status. They understand that the demonization of immigrants uh, hasn't been pointing at uh, immigrants coming from Ireland, uh -huh. but pointing at immigrants coming from Mexico. They understand that it's very racialized and they perceive it as an attack against Latinos. I mean, it's, I think in part, the reason why Bernie Sanders has done so well amongst Latinos. Latino voters mm -hmm. is that it's perceived that he's directly talking about those issues and he's also talking about sort of bread and butter issues that are important to Latinos. But see, I think in Texas, the fact that there's so many young Latinos becoming voters or eligible voters every year, that's probably the real threat along with these changing suburbs. It, but, but that just makes the the Trump tra <clears throat> strategy sometimes with, with, with immigrants just so so nuts because if you think about it, I mean, blacks don't vote Republican, okay? Very small percentage. As a matter of fact, if you go to most black parties and say, hey, I'm a Republican, everyone will stare at you. Latinos seem to be kind of evenly divided. I don't know if it's exactly even, but you know, but it, it wouldn't be uncommon to run into a room full of Latino Republicans. But but the Republican strategy, at least Trump's strategy of of kind of demonizing them, you run the risk of turning Latinos into a new group of blacks where they vote as a block, only Democrat. You know, it just seems it just seems like a really dangerous thing to do. You know, we've seen this movie before. In California in the early 1990s, a Republican candidate uh, for governor, uh, Pete Wilson, he mm -hmm. was actually the governor then, and he was up for re-elect, but he wasn't very popular. It was a big recession in California, had been a big recession in California, and it was deeper in California than the rest of the country and lingered longer. Um, and he was running 20 percentage points behind his Democratic competitor, uh, Kathleen Brown, uh, who was... Uh, Jerry Brown's sister, uh, and he decided that the way that he could win re-election was by supporting Proposition 187, the proposition that in 1994 sought to strip away social services and educational services from undocumented immigrants in the state of California, mm -hmm. and also to run a campaign that was basically anti-immigrant in its tone with a very famous ad showing people crossing the border and saying, they keep coming, yeah. in a kind of dramatic and scary voice. Um, and he won that election, and Prop 187 passed with a very strong margin. But about four years later, uh, Latinos who immigrant Latinos who were uh, upset about that election wound up naturalizing in big numbers and voting at higher numbers than average uh, non-immigrant uh, Latinos in California. And their young folks began to get mobilized as well. Uh, People 
really shifted from that period of time. It wasn't just a Latino political backlash, but a number of other things we can talk about. But currently in California, uh, Republicans do not hold a single statewide office. Democrats hold a supermajority in both the state assembly and in the state senate, meaning they can pass legislation mm -hmm. without getting needing to get a single Republican vote. vote. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you ask political party in the United States, I'm uh, sorry, in California, uh, the Democratic Party is the number one party. The number two party declined the state. Yeah. Uh, number three, the Republican Party. So <laughs> really a marginalized party. Now, what's interesting is that's been the, re the, the Trump strategy. Didn't have to be. You know, George W. Bush, yeah. a Texas governor who had a lot of dealings with Latinos in the state of Texas, had a very moderate position around immigration. It was a supported, compassionate conservative. conservative supported, yeah. supported some form of legalization for undocumented, et cetera. Um, he, in uh, his reelection campaign in 2004, according to the exit polls, got somewhere between 38, 42 percent of the Latino vote because that vote could be uh, culturally conservative around abortion. Yeah. Uh, church yeah, issues, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that was gay marriage, then. et cetera. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but currently, uh, they're not many Latinos. You're right. There's a sort of Republican Latino uh, group that was actually quite attached, partly because Ronald Reagan was responsible for the amnesty yeah, yeah, in the yeah, late yeah, 1980s. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that yes. And it created a big attachment to Ronald Reagan. Uh, but what Trump has been managing to do is to whittle down the advantage amongst Latinos. So it's very difficult now for Latinos to say that they might support uh, the same president who is threatening to deport your grandmother. <laughs> yeah, that, that just never seemed like a lot, because I'm like, dude, you, you look yeah. outside, you see how many Latinos out there? <laughs> you, you might need to modify that message. <laughs> yes, I know, and Trump has been trying to do the same thing with African Americans as well, trying to point out that uh, the unemployment rate for African Americans is at its lowest. Uh -huh. And I think, at least for most black voters, they're like, thank you, Obama. Uh, yeah. That is, they know what drove it to get there. And they also know that this is a president cut from, in their view, some racist cloth. And that this is not someone you can uh, trust to really have your best interests in mind. And so, you know, Trump did sign that piece of legislation, which represents a few first steps toward uh, criminal justice Just reform, reform. Mm -hmm. um, and I think can argue that he's made some progress on that and also on the economic issues, but folks ain't buying. But you don't think you have a stronger government when you have both parties? Well, we shouldn't just have two parties, because I mean, like Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, to me, shouldn't necessarily be in the same party. They're they're very different, you know what I mean. And then you could have someone like a, a Ted Cruz, who's you know on one side, and then you have more of a moderate Republicans. Like, like these, all different parties, but whatever. We we just have have um have two. I don't even remember what my question was be uh, uh, was going to no, be. <laughs> no, I, I no, I think I know what you're. I'd like any uh, academic, I can answer a question you didn't ask. So, so uh, I, 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 back, I back to it now. I back to it now. So, but don't you think you have a better government when you have people from both sides cont contributing? I think you have a better government when you have reasonable voices talking together about how to govern. Uh, when you've got a Republican Party that's locked in a sort of moment of anti-immigrant hysteria uh -huh. and tax cutting without considering the consequences, those aren't reasonable voices. And so I think that one of the things that sometimes needs to happen is that a party needs to be marginalized enough to be able to figure out its way back to the center. Apparently, the Republican Party in California has been not able to learn that lesson over the last uh, 20 years. Hopefully, the Republican Party nationwide will do it. You know, I was asked the other day, I gave a presentation about California, and someone who is himself a moderate Republican, and I have friends who are moderate Republicans. Uh, this was just someone in, at, a, at a talk, said, you know, exactly the same thing. Don't you think uh, it would be better mm -hmm. if the Republican Party 
uh, was able to participate, uh, come to the middle, have some moderate voices. Um, I said, yeah, but that's not on me. Uh, that's on the Republican Party being able to reform itself. You know, I think while the Democratic Party certainly has a progressive wing, the bulk of the Democratic Party is kind of center left. Um, and even while I might myself be positioned uh, in my own views over to the left, I'm enough of an analyst to look at where the bulk of the party is. And that means that we're more likely to get uh, Medic Medicare for all as an option mm -hmm. than we are for Medi-Cal as a whole, Medicare as a whole, as a mandate. Yeah. We're more likely to get some modified version of college debt relief than we are to get debt relief for every uh, college student who kind of went through. So there are moderating voices within the Democratic Party. It's really challenging right now to find moderating voices within the Republican Party, uh, particularly on issues like immigration. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. I want to ask you about cryptocurrencies for a second, changing topic. How familiar are you with Bitcoin? Not that familiar. <laughs> but are you one of those economists who like, it's garbage, don't buy it? Or you, or you see the future of a digital currency? Um, I'm not buying any of it. Um, I think there can be a future there. I think we'd really need to um, <laughs> wait for this to play out and uh, develop. Um, and I'm a little concerned with the way in which cryptocurrency has been able to hide. I mean, I understand why people want to do it for their own privacy, uh -huh. but when you're able to hide transactions that should be out in public, uh, that's a little bit worrisome. It, it depends It depends on the coin, actually, because with Bitcoin, they say the transactions are private, but not really. You know, you... you there might not be a name on this particular account, but you could see where money was trying. Like you could follow it better than you could follow cash. There are some there are some currencies like Monero that hide all transactions where you can't um where you have no idea how this got there and where it came from. That's secretive. But do you see? But okay. But forget Bitcoin for a second. But do you see a point in time where we could have some form of digital currency? In the U.S., where I don't have to go my wallet for cash, I could have something, not a credit card. We're talking actual, I guess, an app on your phone where we go around and pay. Because I know they do stuff like this in China all the time. They use oh, WeChat. Yeah. They, they, they're way ahead of us. <laughs> but wherein we pay our bills using our phones by an approved government currency. Well, I don't know about you, but I pay a lot of my bills with my phone currently. <laughs> you know, you can log into your bank account. Uh -huh. uh, you can... Uh, use the Apple Pay, the uh -huh. product that I use, uh, to be able to charge most things. I think this is going to be much more widespread. It's also going to cause a big panic when you lose your phone, uh -huh. uh, because <laughs> no, it, so it much, does. It does. So much will be there. So, uh, but I, but I, you know, whether or not that needs to happen with a cryptocurrency, uh -huh. or whether or not it happens just by moving to di d even more digital exchange, right? Uh -huh. um, you know, my. I have two uh, kids, okay. one who's 33 years old and one that's uh, 30. They think that both bank accounts and cash are just complete things of the past, right? So uh, any change between us often occurs through Venmo. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, we talk too. We hang out together. But if we're exchanging money, uh -huh. usually it's me giving them money. Uh -huh. I can't think of a single <laughs> instance of money coming the other direction, <laughs> although I'm I'm hoping for that as I age and they get more successful. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, I, th I think that kind of exchange is going to certainly get more uh, common. Uh -huh. Because here's, here's the big issue. Because uh, uh, recently in New York, a lot of the coffee shops were card only, no cash. And it makes sense for business to do that because you don't, you don't have to have an armor truck coming out picking up cash or having, you know, to sneak out in the middle of the night with the cash to try to get to a bank. If you have everything by card, you don't have to worry about security, okay? Someone breaks in, steal a credit card, slips, who cares? You could figure that out. But in New York, um, I guess some New York, um, on, on the local level, at least, in New, York, in, in New York City, realized that, wait a minute, this eliminated a lot of the poor people out there who yeah. do not have cards. Yeah. So how do, how do we make this work for all of us? Because 
It's just so efficient not using cash. But how is it that I'm not leaving behind the guy sleeping on the streets? I, I, you see some balance? Some middle of the road there? Well, this move towards simply using your phone to pay for everything is going to accelerate as a result of the coronavirus. If you think about it, oh, that yeah. cash is incredibly dirty. Healthy. Yes. Um, people <laughs> yes. exchange it <laughs> back and forth. At the end of the day, your hands are just muddled with everyone's terms. Uh-huh. Uh, credit card, that means I'm taking a physical thing uh-huh. out of my uh, wallet. I'm handing it to you to put into a machine, and you are uh, accumulating a lot of germs as a result of that. Waving my phone, which I alone touch, in front of something that catches the beam and then pays for it, um, well, that's a lot safer. And that's going to be another acceleration to a different way of doing business. I can imagine if you try to think about a way that could limit the spread of virus, moving to phone only for pain is something that would be quite helpful in that. I mean, I, for the life, life of me right now, I took the metro over here. The fact that I have to pull the card out and wave it <laughs> instead of just waving my phone seems yeah. incredibly primitive. Right? Yeah. Uh, and also kind of incredibly uh, perhaps risky. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Just like I was saying that what how we address this coronavirus runs the risk of leaving <laughs> low-income people behind and making who have these kind of jobs where they need to show up don't have paid sick leave, uh-huh. and if they don't show up, they don't get paid. Uh, this is another kind of thing as we move in a direction uh, that moves us to just using our phones to pay for things. What about people who live in a cash-only economy because that's all they've ever known or because they haven't been able to uh-huh. – uh, they've got evicted and so they can't get credit in a way that allows them to put stuff on their phone, etc. We're going to have to think a lot more – creatively if we want to create an economy that marriage uh, marries innovation and inclusion about how do we take the innovation and make sure that it's actually inclusive very true very true wrapping up here quick question do you think donald trump is manipulating the market not right now but i'm talking he would come out and be like oh we have a deal with china okay stock market shoots up or oh, there's no deal stock market shoots down and, I mean, some people have really been cashing in on that. Now, 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 now there are people on both sides of the aisle. Um, of the aisle you know, there, there are some, you know, Democrats who go, you know, um, that, that, that's just coincidence, you know. But where do you stand as an economist? Do you think there's someone profiting on, on, on some of the things that he's saying? Well, there are definitely— I mean, because they had, because they had prior knowledge that this was coming. Um, there's been some discussion and— uh, news articles about that. It's kind of beyond speculating on my part, or I wouldn't speculate on my part about whether there's kind of inside information mm-hmm. being handed off. I mean, I, I think it's more that he's impulsive. Um, so we saw an example of it yesterday when in a press conference around the uh, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus, he said, oh, we're preparing an economic stimulus package we'll unveil tomorrow afternoon. And reporters have been scrambling through last night and through this morning and administration officials have been saying, well, there's no real economic <laughs> stimulus package. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's actually thought this through. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, um, he's lived, and I think he's worried that he will die by the stock market. Mm-hmm. He's been able to go out and say, look, uh, you know, if you think about uh, the economy since Trump took power, um, the job creation, no faster or larger number of jobs, uh, than the last couple of years of President Obama. GDP growth, promises of moving to 4%, haven't gotten there. Looks like we're slowing down. Yeah. It's actually pretty amazing. The only year that we really juiced up was as a result of this gigantic tax cut. Uh-huh. Um, if you look at uh, the trade issues, which were going to be solved like this, haven't been solved. And in fact, our dependence on China made even more evident yeah. by this pandemic with pharmaceutical chains extending back into China. The thing that he's done is wave a lot of smoke and mirrors, in particular by pointing to the frothy stock market, which has been driven largely by income heading to the wealthy who speculate in the stock market and super low interest rates, uh, which have caused investors to put their money into the stock markets. So 
he has done a lot of trying to juice the market with statements that he thinks are going to impact it. I don't think he's done it with an eye toward uh, the private gains of particular friends. Uh I think he's done it as he's done so much with uh, sort of impulsive conceit. Um, That is, he wants to rescue his own image and he wants to rescue his own electoral chances and he sees that the combination of a public health crisis that's mismanaged and an economy that sinks, Mm. those don't factor in very well for his reelection. He's consistently uh, not been able to be above 50% in terms of his approval rating, but people are a a little bit grudging, like, well, he speaks out of turn. He says stuff that's both uh, stupid and kind of racist, but the economy's doing okay, (laughs) right? Uh, What happens when the economy's not doing okay and when the level of mismanagement has become incredibly clear? That's what we're about to see. Yeah, (laughs) very true. So we're most likely going into recession. How will we know when we're at the bottom? I mean, what signs do you look for? Just from an investment perspective. I just tried to make you all some money. (laughs) Well, there's two different uh, um, bottoms. One is the sort of stock market bottom, and the other is the sort of economic bottom. Um, I think on the stock market, it's always um, hard to tell. There's been a lot of uh, gain, uh, and a lot of it seemed kind of out of proportion to where the underlying real economy was performing. So there may be more retrenchment there as we go along. And I think it's going to be a little bit clearer in the next couple of weeks when we begin to see what juice the Fed can put into the economy and what juice the federal government has as its uh, its disposal. Uh, The bigger thing is going to be to see what happens in the real economy. Are people going to come back out of their homes and start going to restaurants? Um, Are the supply chains that are currently sort of ground to a stop Uh, Are they going to reanimate? And are we going to see, in particular, more business coming through the ports, which suggests that trade is back? So those are the things that I know that I'll be looking for. Uh, The one thing I would say is this is one of those situations in in which the past is an imperfect predictor of the future. It was easier to recover from 2011, uh, 2001, 9-11, because that was a shock to to uh, tourism and a shock to uh, uh, the airline industries. And as security began to get built back in, we saw those industries come back. Uh, this is a combination of a demand slide shock, uh, fear of going out there, lack of spending in airline, lack of spending in retail, lack of spending in uh, restaurants, along with supply side shock, these supply chains being disrupted. It's very rare that we have both happen at the same time, so we're in some uncharted territory. So in terms of the uh, advice you really should be giving your viewers and listeners, it's just hold tight, hold your breath, (laughs) try to be calm, but really be scared just a little bit. (laughs) Listen, thank you. Thank you so much for coming through. We really appreciate it. I would shake your hand, but we're not shaking. We're fist bumping now. All right. All right. Thank you. Fist bump, and I'm still going to wash my hands. (laughs) Me too. Me too. (laughs) All right. Adios, mi gente. Nos vemos.